In 2012, Vertigo dethroned Citizen Kane in Sight and Sound's critics poll to claim the title of greatest film of all time. Six decades after it came out, Alfred Hitchcock's film is so enduring because it reveals the deeper link between what we fear and what we desire. And it's also about the dark obsessions at the heart of cinema itself. The film's title refers to Scotty's fear of heights. I have acrophobia, which gives me vertigo, and I get dizzy. But the film is also about other kinds of falling feelings, falling in love and having a death wish. And Vertigo replicates Scotty's off-balance falling feeling in us through plot twists, dolly zooms, and the ending that completely throws us for a loop. We asked film professor Julian Cornell to help us illuminate what Vertigo is really about. I think Vertigo is one of those films that really gets in your head because it talks about the connection between death and desire. And it talks about the way that we don't even understand sometimes in ourselves what motivates us and how often fear is at the heart of our motivations. Before we go on, we want to tell you a little bit about this video sponsor. Mubi is a curated film streaming service with a twist. You get 30 films per month, a new film every day. And these films are a hand-picked selection of influential movie gems from around the globe. We're huge fans of Mubi at Screen Prism. So go ahead and click the link in our description below to get a full month of Mubi for free. True to its name, Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo leaves us feeling a little dizzy. By the end, retired Detective Scotty discovers that the Madeline he was madly in love with never existed. A woman named Judy was just pretending to be her, to help pull off the murder of the real Madeline Elster, whom we never meet in the film. I was the tool and you were the victim of Gavin Elster's plan to murder his wife. He chose me to play the part because I looked like her. All this time, Scotty has been haunted by the memory of what he thought he saw, Madeline committing suicide at the Mission San Juan Batista, when in fact what he saw was Madeline's husband throwing down the dead body of the wife he'd already killed. After Scotty discovers the truth, he wants to recreate the experience of this faked suicide. I need you to be Madeline for a while. And when it's done, we'll both be free. He decides to climb the stairs of the bell tower to the place where the fake suicide went down. Amazingly, Scotty does make it to the top. I made it. But as Scotty and Judy kiss and make up, a nun startles her, and she falls from the bell tower to her death, echoing the demise of the real Madeline. The ending brings the story full circle because Vertigo starts with Scotty slipping during a rooftop chase and clinging to a rain gutter. When a policeman tries to help him, Scotty is indirectly responsible for the man's death. So what are we supposed to make of all the convoluted reveals and strange repetitions we see? Early in the film, Scotty's friend Gavin Elster asks Scotty to follow his wife, Madeline. So from the start of their relationship, Scotty is observing Madeline from afar, rather than interacting with her. The bright colors and soft focus as Scotty watches Madeline gives these scenes a dreamlike quality, as if there's something unreal about how he's seeing her. Madeline often goes to see the portrait of her great-grandmother Carlotta, and we see her looking at the painting while Scotty looks at her. So the parallel, the way Scotty gazes at Madeline as if she's a work of art, hints to the audience that this Madeline herself is an artistic creation, just like that painting. We'll find out later that the Madeline we're coming to know with Scotty is a fake persona created by Judy. And this whole fictional personality is built around Scotty, designed to draw him in. While Scotty is following Madeline, she jumps into the San Francisco Bay, feigning a suicide attempt. Scotty completely undresses her and tucks her into his bed. We expect her to be a little freaked out when she wakes up with a total stranger, but instead she's grateful. I'm glad you didn't take me home. I, I wouldn't have known you. From what we've seen so far, Scotty strikes us less as the hero and more as a damsel in distress type himself. Incidentally, that might remind us a little of another Jimmy Stewart character in a Hitchcock classic. Given Scotty's weakness, it's a turn on for him to meet this troubled woman with a patchy memory who needs Scotty to rescue her. Don't leave me. You're still with me. All the time. He wants to be a courageous, desirable man, and Madeline makes him feel like one. My name's John Ferguson. It's a good, strong name. If we wanted to get Jungian about it, we might even interpret Madeline as Scotty's anima. 
Carl Jung theorized that each man has an anima, a feminine unconscious or inner self made up of the more feminine qualities that the man lacks in his normal behavior. Madeline is really Scotty's ideal woman. Yeah, well, don't you think it's kind of a waste for the two of us to, to want to separate? Uh -huh. And when this fictional woman dies, Scotty feels like he's lost an essential part of himself. It's telling that Scotty is head over heels for Madeline, but can't seem to hit it off with any of the real women he meets. He's not attracted to his ex fiance Midge, who's an independent working woman. And maybe that's because, unlike Madeline, Midge isn't at all mysterious or unknowable. What's this doohickey? It's a brassiere. You know about those things. You're a big boy now. Midge's stability and normalcy make Scotty view her as a maternal figure, even though she's clearly much younger than him. You're not lost. Others here. Then, when Scotty meets Judy, he's not interested in who she really is either. Madeline's neutral clothing, platinum hair, and natural makeup make her a blank slate for Scotty to project onto. But Judy wears bright colors and garish makeup, reflecting a stronger sense of self. Scotty has to neutralize her appearance and transform her into Madeline to be able to feel something for her. You're looking for the suit that she wore for me. You want me to be dressed like her. It's striking, though, that Scotty isn't doing all of this on his own. Judy is participating in this process. So Vertigo observes that the overwhelming need for male validation makes women willing to change themselves. Judy is miserable as Scotty tries to make her over. Couldn't you like me? Just me the way I am? But she agrees because she wants to be loved. Will you love me? Yes. Yes. Fine. Fine, then I'll do it. They don't care anymore about me. She has to turn herself into a male fantasy to get this approval. Through these interactions, the film is getting at how this male need to alter and control women can destroy a woman's sense of self, even as she feels compelled to enable what's happening. You identify with Jimmy Stewart's character, and you identify with his perceptions, and you want him to achieve his goals. You want Scotty and Madeline to be together and to fall in love. And then the second half of the film, he begins to take apart your feelings about him. Hitchcock begins to make us feel uncomfortable with someone we've identified with. It's hard not to feel as well that Hitchcock is being a little self-reflective here. Judy's metamorphosis into Madeline could symbolize the way a director controls the performance of an actress. You made you over just like I made you over, only better. Not only the clothes and the hair, but the looks and the manner and the words. Hitchcock himself was known for his precision as a director. Slowly, slowly, and slowly. And of course, for casting cold, stylish blondes. It's as if Scotty is crafting the so-called Hitchcock blonde right in front of our eyes. So the director seems perfectly willing to observe himself and his own possible perversity with the unflinching honesty he brings to all psychologies on screen. Whatever he may have thought about the morality of it, the subtext of Vertigo suggests that he's aware of this twisted male-female dynamic and how interconnected it is with creating cinema and art. Did he train you? Did he rehearse you? Did he tell you exactly what to do, what to say? Judy's a fallen woman. She's broken away from how respectable women are supposed to behave. After all, she helped orchestrate another woman's murder. And Vertigo's last scene makes her fallen woman status literal, as she falls off the bell tower. Judy's not the only fallen woman in the film. There's also Carlotta, who we never meet but hear a lot about. Earlier in the film, we learn that Carlotta's husband cast her aside and separated her from their child. So she was destitute before eventually killing herself. So he kept the child? and threw her away. You know, men could do that in those days. They had the power and the freedom. It's clear, though, that men are still exploiting their power over women in this story. Near the end, Judy implicitly links herself to Carlotta when she chooses to wear Carlotta's necklace. This is what makes Scotty realize that she was pretending to be Madeline. And in the end, Judy's fate is similar to Carlotta's. 
So all of these instances suggest that male power and dominance is so destructive it actually kills women, and the fallen woman is truly a victim. Meanwhile, the nun who frightens Judy in the final scene appears like a dark, threatening presence. She represents chastity and religion, so these forces too seem to be an enemy, threatening the safety of this vulnerable woman. God have mercy. Acrophobia, or the fear of heights, is sometimes interpreted as a fear that we'll jump to our deaths. In other words, we can greatly desire what we also most fear. Scotty's acrophobia symbolizes that he's torn between a death wish and a will to live. If you think about our own desires and our own fears, we can't even acknowledge them and they make us uncomfortable. And he's showing you this by this portrayal of this character, Scotty. Vertigo suggests that maybe what we call love is a kind of death wish too. Part of what draws Scotty to Madeline is that she's attracted to death, like he is. There's someone within me and she says I must die. She feels that mysterious pull to fall or to jump. Why did you jump? What was there inside that told no, you to jump? Madeline might even be the embodiment of death, since she's supposedly possessed by Carlotta's ghost. Do you believe that someone out of the past, someone dead, can enter and take possession of a living being? So Scotty's infatuation with Madeline is really an infatuation with death itself. When I come to the end of the corridor, there's nothing but darkness. And I know that when I walk into the darkness, that I'll die. Hitchcock represents the aura of death around Madeline and Judy with the color green. When Scotty and Madeline visit the Sequoia Forest, green seems to symbolize an eternal life. Their true name is Sequoia Sempervirens, always green, ever living. But this ever living quality actually suggests a kind of ghostliness. The first time Scotty sees Madeline, she's wearing a green stole and later driving a green car. Meanwhile, Judy is wearing green when Scotty sees her for the first time, the resemblance making him feel like he's just seen a ghost. And the light from the sign outside Judy's building makes her bedroom glow eerily green. When Judy becomes Madeline for Scotty, she steps into a tower of green light and appears ethereal, not quite there. Then they kiss against a solid green backdrop. This scene marks Judy's transition from a living person into a dead thing, as Scotty has resurrected the ghost of Madeline. In a conversation with Francois Truffaut, Hitchcock confirmed that this scene is about the desire to love a dead thing. Sex you have a man creating a sex image that he can't go to bed with her until he's got her back to the thing he wants to go to bed with or metaphorically indulged in a form of necrophilia. That's what it really was. I should be back from your face and pinned at the neck. I told her that. I told you that. When she came back from having her hair made blonde and it wasn't up, this means she has stripped but won't take her knickers off. So the moment that Scotty falls in love with Judy is also the moment he fully kills her true identity, as she submits to what he wants and recreates a ghost for him. Vertigo has a theme of falling backward into our own pasts and memories. One final thing I have to do, and then I'll be free of the past. Scotty embodies Freud's idea of repetition compulsion, the tendency to repeat, relive, or regularly dream about a traumatic event after it's over. When the policeman falls in the first scene of the movie, Scotty looks down from where he's hanging and sees him splayed on the sidewalk, with his limbs in a kind of spiral shape. This traumatic experience hangs over Scotty for the rest of the film. He sees voids and spirals all over the place, which remind him of the sight of the policeman's body and his experience of hanging off that building, fearing he's going to fall. In the museum scene, he notices that Carlotta's and Madeline's hairdos have the same spiral shape. Then his view, looking down the bell tower stairs, appears like another empty void, 
and his nightmare of Carlotta's grave reflects the same fear of falling into empty space. Ultimately, the film doesn't tell us what we're supposed to do with these fears and obsessions that come from our pasts. Early on, Midge suggests that the only cure for Scotty's fear of heights is another traumatic incident. Midge, what did you mean there's no losing it? What? The, 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 the acrophobia. Well, I asked my doctor. He said that only another emotional shock could do it and probably wouldn't. So climbing the bell tower stairs at the end is Scotty's attempt to reenact his trauma from the beginning. You're my second chance, Judy. And it works. His vertigo is cured, but at a high price. Judy is sacrificed, and Scotty has become a lot like Elster, the wife killer. So just confronting our fears doesn't truly solve their underlying psychological causes, which we'd be better off trying to understand instead of just trying to eliminate the surface problem. In the last scene, Scotty finds himself back where he started at the beginning, looking down from a great height at someone's dead body. So because he hasn't looked deep enough within himself, his cycle hasn't been broken. It's a cliche to say Vertigo is the best film ever made. I don't know whether it is or it isn't, but it's clearly one of the most interesting movies ever made. 60 years after its release, Vertigo continues to resonate and send us reeling. As we keep trying to understand more and more layers of this movie, we play it over and over in our heads. And in that way, we leave Vertigo feeling a lot like Scotty. One doesn't often get a second chance. I want to stop being haunted. Hi guys, this is Susanna. I'm really happy to be talking about Mubi today because I've actually been a subscriber for years. I love this streaming service. Mubi is a treasure trove of films that you won't discover anywhere else. They curate exceptional movies from around the globe, and every day a new film is added and the oldest is taken away. So in this world where it's very easy to spend hours debating what you should watch and feel overwhelmed by all the choice, Mubi is like having a really cool friend with amazing taste in movies, making it so much easier for you. They feature hard-to-come-by masterpieces, indie festival darlings, influential art house and foreign films, lesser-known films by your favorite famous directors, and more. Plus, you can even download the films to watch offline, and there are no ads ever. One film you can watch right now on Mubi is Mia Hansen Loves the Father of My Children, about a French film producer and his family. It's an understated, beautifully perceptive story, and it won the jury special prize at Cannes Film Festival. You can try Mubi out right now for free for a whole month. Just click the link in the description below.